Despite the sensational title to this video, I do want to get into some serious objections to Thomism, and especially the Thomistic conception of God. This discussion is going to hinge on the notion of absolute divine simplicity, and particularly the conflation of essence and will that you find in Thomas. This is especially the case with regard to God's knowledge of creatures, which is my main issue with Thomism. Ancillary to this issue is the problem of natural theology too, because it is in effect the foundation of the Thomistic view of absolute divine simplicity. I won't devote too much time to this issue as it merits its own video, and I may discuss it another time. It is in contrast to the theology of St. Maximus the Confessor that I want to make my criticism of these doctrines of Thomas, as I believe that St. Maximus possesses the mind of the Church on these issues, in demonstrable opposition to Thomas's views. If, as I say, the two are found to be in tension with one another, this will be a serious problem for Thomism. St. Maximus's theology, after all, was championed at the Council of Chalcedon, and his teachings about Christology are essential to the Orthodox faith. All the more so because St. Maximus's exegesis of certain passages from the scriptures are authoritative, while Thomas Aquinas's claim to authority rests on his being a synthesizer of Christian doctrine, remaining in continuity with the Church Fathers. It is not possible for this to be the case for Thomas if he contradicts a seminal theologian as St. Maximus. I think the key source to look at is Thomas Aquinas's Summa Contra Gentiles, which has some of his clearest statements about divine simplicity and the identity of will and essence in God, especially relevant are chapters 73 to 77 in Book 1. I will not read through all of these in their entirety, but I will present some extracts. For example, he writes in chapter 76, Again, since God wills himself always, if he wills himself and other things by different acts, it will follow that there are at once two acts of will in him. This is impossible, since one simple power does not have at once two operations. Furthermore, in every act of the will, the object willed is to the one willing as a mover to the moved. If, then, there be some action of the divine will, by which God wills things other than himself, which is diverse from the action by which he wills himself, there will be in him some other mover of the divine will. This is impossible. Moreover, God's willing is his being, as has been proved. But in God there is only one being, therefore there is in him only one willing. Again, willing belongs to God according as he is intelligent. Therefore, just as by one act he understands himself and other things, insofar as his essence is the exemplar of all things, so by one act he wills himself and other things, insofar as his goodness is the likeness of all goodness. Immediately, those familiar with St. Maximus's Ambigua will notice some problematic assumptions here, which are really only justified if we grant certain presuppositions. The most problematic idea here, however, is the identification of the divine will and its object with the divine nature. This flies in the face of St. Athanasius's discourses against the Arians, in which he clearly distinguished will from nature in God, so that the Son may not be mistaken for a creature. This alone undercuts Aquinas' entire argument in this passage, along with the following remarks in chapter 73. That the will of God is his essence. It belongs to God to be endowed with will, in so far as he is intelligent, as has been shown. But God has understanding by his essence, as was proved above. So therefore does he have will. God's will, therefore, is his very essence. Furthermore, if will were something added to the divine substance, since the divine substance is something complete in being, it would follow that will would be added to it as an accident to a subject, that the divine substance would be related to it as potency to act, and that there would be composition in God. All this was refuted above. Hence, it is not possible that the divine will be something added to the divine substance. It is, I suggest, impossible to reconcile this explanation with St. Maximus the Confessor's remarks in Ambiguum 24, in which he clearly distinguishes the willing subject from the object of will and the activity of willing. Aquinas has simply presupposed a dialectic of substance and accident, categories into which the will cannot be made to fit, 
Indeed, St. Maximus in this passage mentions several categories which cannot be reduced to substance or accidents. As he writes, For if we say that the soul's powers, which one might well call essential powers, able to complete its substance, are able to operate in the substance in which they exist, we do not say that they are capable of actively moving to produce anything without the consent of a willing subject. If, however, we grant hypothetically that, on the basis of their natural movement, these powers will to act or operate on their own, without, if I may put it like this, the impulse of him whose powers they are, then there is absolutely nothing to prevent them from operating effective on their own impulse. However, actual deeds do not by any means follow upon power when this latter does not have the impulse of him whose power it is, proposing it to the concrete actual end, because the power in and of itself is not self-subsistent. Thus it was in vain that the Arians rallied round the will as such, for it can effectively accomplish nothing apart from the willing subject who possesses and exercises it. Lest I be accused of misrepresenting Aquinas on these issues, we may turn to some of his defenders and look at this issue of creation in their own words. Contemporary Thomas Edward Faser grapples with this position of Aquinas in a blog post addressing the very issue of necessary creation. He writes, But doesn't the fact that God wills himself and other things in a single act entail that he wills the latter as necessarily as he does the former? No. You might say that it is in a single act that the sun both shines and causes the moon to shine. But even if the sun shined of absolute necessity, it wouldn't follow that the moon shined, since of course the moon could have failed to exist even if the sun hadn't. But this is to appeal to something outside the sun which limits what sort of effects it will have. So doesn't the analogy fail, since given God's omnipotence there is nothing outside him that can limit what sort of effect he will have? No, the analogy does not fail. And this brings us to Aquinas' reasons for saying that the fact that God is necessary does not entail that his effects are necessary. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas writes, Sometimes a necessary cause has a non-necessary relation to an effect, owing to a deficiency in the effect and not in the cause. Even so, the sun's power has a non-necessary relation to some contingent events on this earth, owing to a defect not in the solar power, but in the effect that proceeds not necessarily from the cause. In the same way that God does not necessarily will some of the things that he wills, does not result from defect in the divine will, but from a defect belonging to the nature of the thing willed, namely that the perfect goodness of God can be without it, and such defect accompanies all created goods. The answer here is that creation as such is an unwilled effect of a willed activity, that is the divine nature. In other words, the actual created order has to be accidental for the Thomist, in order not to be necessary. Otherwise he would have to admit that God is capable of willing multiple things, as St. Maximus teaches, distinguishing the divine will from the divine nature. This is, however, not something any proponent of absolute divine simplicity could admit. So we have a creation that is necessarily defective, because it is defined dialectically in a relationship of contingencies to the divine nature. This is a peculiar way of describing what is a work of God. As we have seen for St. Maximus, the Logi, which are the divine wills, are described as portions of God, that is, the defining limits of creaturely participation in God. In other words, God wills for creatures to be participants in his divine energies, bringing them into being from nothing into a state of potential, so that they might freely will to participate in his love. This is anything but an accidental effect of God's self-love. On the contrary, it is an intentional procession of divine love ad extra towards beings he wills to create. I want to thank Discord user Maximus for referring me to Ephesians chapter 1, in which St. Paul can help us to understand this issue, writing, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also have we obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. This is precisely what St. Maximus the Confessor is articulating in his Ambiguum 7, exploring its ramifications in more detail. I think this is a powerful testimony to the fact that the patristic faith is the apostolic faith, and that this theology of St. Maximus is faithful to the Scriptures. Clearly this notion of the divine counsel and divine will is of central importance to our redemption, and as such it is of the utmost importance that we maintain this aspect of our theology. A recent work on this subject which concedes pretty much all of these points is Matthew Fevering's Engaging the Doctrine of Creation, particularly chapters 1 and 2. As he writes, How does this understanding of eternity relate to the doctrine of the divine ideas? The divine ideas belong to God's simultaneously whole presencing, totum esse presens, by which he is perfectly, intelligently and creatively present to all things, and so the divine ideas should not be conceived of as a mere impersonal data bank upon which God draws. But if they should be conceived in a more personal way, what precisely might this involve? Here Gregory Doolin's discussion of Aquinas' theology of the divine ideas offers helpful precision. The divine ideas are not that by which God understands all things. Rather, they are God's understanding, that which he understands. As God's knowledge of that which he understands, the divine ideas are first and foremost God's knowledge of himself. If the divine ideas are God's understanding that which he understands, however, it might seem that there is really only one divine idea, God himself. Etienne Gilson and James Ross hold that this is, in fact, Aquinas' position. In this regard, Doolin distinguishes between a logical and an ontological multiplicity. The divine ideas involve the former kind of multiplicity. Their logical multiplicity is founded on the ontological reality of the truth of the divine essence. This understanding is part and parcel of Aquinas' conception of God, and his understanding of the divine attributes as only notionally distinct, albeit with a fundamentum in re, a foundation in the absolutely simple essence. Aquinas affirms that the eternal divine will determines itself freely vis-à-vis -vis creatures, since the triune God wills only his own Godhead in a necessary way. Eternally, God freely wills to create finite things and to be present in certain intimate ways to his creatures, but this willing does not change God, since his will is his infinite actuality. As Aquinas states, although God's willing a thing is not by absolute necessity, yet it is necessary by supposition on account of the unchangeableness of the divine will. It seems right that a study of creation should begin with the divine ideas and with God's work of creation ex nihilo in ordering all things to his goodness. But it is necessary now to engage more directly the question of whether the creator God can truly be simple. I recognize that at first glance this question seems to require a negative answer, given that God acts not only ad intra but also ad extra and therefore seems to possess a multiplicity of actions. Thomas Aquinas tries to resolve this problem by arguing that God's act is not multiple, but instead, without ceasing to be perfectly simple and one, is both an imminent action, an action remaining in God, and a transitive action, an action terminating outside God. As James Dolezal observes, we must not imagine that God's will, like ours, has a beginning or inheres in God as an accident determining him to be this or that way. The fact that God's will is pure act, however, does not mean that his necessary willing of his goodness renders creation necessary. What is excluded instead is the notion that God's will moves from an original indeterminacy to a decision to create, 
as though God's actuality could change, or as though there were a God prior to the Creator. This emphasis on the fact that the divine will, as infinite actuality, does not change, does not make creation necessary. It simply confirms that the Creator God truly is God, rather than a finite cause or mere being among beings. The essential point is well expressed by David Hart. God's will encompasses the whole span of his power and being, and is therefore perfectly free. All that God wills belongs naturally, though not necessarily, to that one eternal act whereby he wills his own goodness. We have observed elsewhere that a distinction between will and nature exists in God and is not temporally mutable, so this appears to be a false choice. Bentley Hart, moreover, is not a person to cite on this, as even Edward Faser has argued against Hart for the contingency of creation. In sum, if God were not simple, then God could not be infinite actuality, infinite power and fecundity. It is only because God is simple actuality that, as Aquinas says, creation is the proper act of God alone. Only a simple God could produce being absolutely, which is what the act of creation involves. And since there is no reason that God could not exist without creation, the proper act of God in willing the existence of creatures through his eternal intelligent self-presencing must be supremely free. It follows, I submit, that the triune God can be freely creative, not despite, but precisely because he is simple. Beyond this, nothing more can be said. With respect to levering, I think this is something of a misreading of apophaticism. I would say it arises from a kind of punning or equivocal use of language, especially with the terms God and the divine essence. After all, what would it mean for St. Maximus, or indeed St. Paul, to pick out the divine counsel and the divine will, if it were simply a fragmentary way of discussing the divine nature? It strikes me as a comparable attitude to the Monophysites and their equivocation on the two natures of Christ. 